Hey, gang, this week's episode is brought to you by the Arizona Office of Tourism. This spring, follow your favorite baseball teams to Arizona for Cactus League spring training. Amazing weather and landscapes, exciting outdoor adventure, incredible food. Arizona is the perfect home base for baseball fans. Plan your spring training getaway at visitarizona.com slash spring training. Yes, that's visitarizona.com slash spring training. And now here's our show. At the greatest indoor soccer game ever played, with the exception of the Wichita Wings, that is, who were eliminated from the MISL playoffs last night by the Steamers of St. Louis. For the Wings, it was an absolutely heartbreaking and gut-wrenching way to end a superb season. For three periods, they were totally in control. The legendary Checkerdome crowd sat in stunned silence as the upstart Wings built a 6-1 to one lead with just 15 minutes to play. But then came the avalanche, and before you could say slow, Lobo Ilyevsky, it was tied 7-all and headed for sudden death overtime and ultimately the first shootout in MISL playoff history. With both sides physically and emotionally spent, a controversial tripping call on Wings backup goalkeeper Brad Higgs tipped the match in the steamer's favor and suddenly the dream had become the worst possible nightmare. After the game in a steamy Wichita locker room, an emotional Roy Turner lashed out at the officials who he felt cost him a shot at the MISL championship. The team playing like that and then getting beaten just amazes me. And I don't care what it costs me. I've never seen officiating like it in my life. I just have never seen anything like it. We're not a physical team. Uh, Maybe I should hire some boxers or something because the, I think that so many things were let go tonight. I just, it's not an excuse. Congratulations, St. Louis. Good luck in the final. But uh, I think they know, and these guys know, it's the Wichita Wings who should be in the final. It was just diabolical. We couldn't believe it. We were all just saying, well, they may as well just said before the game, New York and St. Louis go and play. Yeah. There's no way they want little Wichita in the final. Simple as that. 12 minutes ago, we're leading 7 5. Uh, we're counting playoff money. We're counting. You know, we're, we're talking final against New York, and, and, and I don't think anybody on our team thought we were going to lose this game tonight. The way we played, we annihilated them, I think. It's, it's hard not to be bitter, complain about the referee, complain about the crowd, complain about their players. But as far as it comes down to us in the end, we uh, just didn't quite hold it long enough. The pain of this kind of loss isn't easily forgotten. But the all-out effort and character the Wings displayed last night won't be easily forgotten either. From St. Louis, Mark Allen, TV10 Sports. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Well, greetings. How are you, everybody? My name is indeed, as announced, Tim Hanlon, and I appreciate it. To no end, you finding our little podcast we like to call Good Seats still available. And yes, it is indeed the uh, curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. And there's no uh, there's no better used to be, uh, at least for this week, than the old major indoor soccer league. We love the MISL, uh, especially the original version. And uh, we have uh, a tremendous excuse to go back to uh, one of the more emblematic teams. Uh, of the old MISL, and that was the Wichita Wings. If you remember back on our uh, episode number 31, uh, which you can find on goodseatsstillavailable.com or or just download from any of your podcasting uh, catchers out there, you'll find that episode. We had uh, Mike Romalis, who was uh, joining us again this week uh, with uh, uh, his pal Tim O'Brien, and they uh, wrote a book back in the day called Make This Town Big, where we kind of got into the origin story. Of the Wichita Wings, and you might remember in that episode, uh, there was uh, some not so subtle hints about the possibility of doing an actual documentary uh, about the Wichita Wings, perhaps uh, one of the longest lasting and uh, most uh, one of the most memorable teams in the MISL for numerous reasons. And uh, indeed, that's what's happened. And uh, come this uh, coming Saturday, uh, February 22nd, 2020, if you're listening to this episode as we drop it. Uh, as we do every Monday morning, uh, this in this case, the 17th of, of February, if you happen to be uh, in or near the Wichita, Kansas metropolitan area, the movie is making its world debut. It's called God Save the Wings. Uh, it will be at the uh, Orpheum Theater. It is uh, going to be quite the event. And a lot of the old uh, Wings players and management and fans will all be there. If you remember names like Roy Turner and Andy Chapman and uh, let's see, Eric Rasmussen and Omar Gomez and Mike Dowler 
Uh, let's see. Cr- great names. Kevin Cooley and Arnan Chico Borja. Uh, let's see. Bill Kentling, the old general manager. Uh, Frank Rasmussen. Kim Rotfed, uh, Jorgen Christensen, Storm and Norma- Norman Piper. I mean, there's just legendary names uh, that go way back into this team known as the Wichita Wings. And uh, it, it is a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to uh, remember, uh, again, one of the more uh, memorable teams in the, uh, the, the short uh, but amazing life of the major indoor soccer league. And uh, we are just ecstatic to have uh, producers Adam Knapp and Mike Romalis uh, part of the uh, the contingent that uh, the the large contingent, uh, the truly a labor of love across many 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 great fans and uh, uh, memorabilists out there, uh, as uh, we celebrate the, uh, the the launch and the debut of God Save the Wings, the documentary about the Wichita Wings, and um, as you'll hear in our conversation, uh, we will absolutely keep you abreast of when that movie uh, will be more generally and widely available. If you can't make it or did not get a chance to make it, depending on when you're listening to this episode. Uh, For the uh, movie's debut, we will absolutely keep you informed as to when you out there in listener land can uh, enjoy this. And uh, Andy Chapman uh, is uh, absolutely uh, a a key central figure in all this. He's the narrator uh, for this movie, and you'll understand why as we get into the conversation. Uh, But I have seen it. I've had the uh, honor of getting to look at it uh, before uh, the uh, general public. And I can tell you it is uh, it's just chock full of great memories. And look, I didn't grow up in the Wichita area. I certainly watched a lot of MISL games in my day and went to more than a few in the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area. Uh, But I will tell you, and I consider myself an aficionado and a, uh, a pretty darn good curator of major indoor soccer league clips. And I will tell you, I was stunned because there was a whole bunch of stuff I'd never seen before. Uh, so there are a lot of great Easter eggs and uh, and and interesting memories and and a whole lot of clips that uh, I, I assure you that you will not seen before uh, in this movie. And again, it's called God Save the Wings and uh, run, don't walk to go see it uh, when and if you are able to do so. And we're getting into that conversation. We learn all about uh, the wings and the history, some things uh, known and some things unknown as we get into our chat with Adam Knapp and Mike Romalis in just a couple of moments time. And uh, of course, that clip that you heard there. Uh, is probably emblematic of of the Wings story on a number of different levels. Yes, the, the Wichita being the by far smallest market in the MISL. Clearly, it's uh, a number of years where it became major league uh, and certainly elevated its status amongst uh, the big cities of San Diego and New York and uh, Cincinnati and St. Louis and others. And of course, St. Louis, the steamers uh, being perhaps the uh, the biggest and most uh, storied rivalries of the uh, the short life of the MISL, uh, perhaps uh, no better evidenced than uh, the recap that you just heard from, uh, arguably, maybe not so arguably, the most memorable and exciting and closest uh, contested game in league history. That was on March 27th, 1981. And if you were watching it live on the USA Cable Network, uh, or live locally, either in St. Louis or in Wichita. Uh, it is a game that uh, you will no doubt not forget. Uh, it was the uh, first of the two major indoor soccer league semifinals in the playoffs. It was sort of a final four kind of thing hosted in St. Louis of all places. Uh, and uh, it was the first ever MISL game to go to a shootout. And uh, the more dramatic uh, a game you will not find in MISL history. The full game is available. It's floating out there on uh, on YouTube. I don't think it's the USA uh, version. I do believe it was uh, one of the local broadcasters, either St. Louis or Wichita. I just don't remember which. Uh, but um, depending on your perspective, it was either the steamers scrapping to come back from a 6-1 deficit uh, after three and change quarters uh, to tie it up and then go into sudden death overtime and end the shootout. Or the wings frittering away that lead, but uh, regardless of uh, of how you view that game, it was uh, indeed a game that uh, it was quintessential, I guess, in sort of understanding the uh, the magic and the uh, the excitement that was the MISL. And you heard there in that clip, Roy Turner, the coach, Kevin Cooley, Hank Leotard, Mike Dowler, not so happy about how the game sort of uh, uh, transpired, and Mark Allen of KAKE Television back in the day. Uh, remembering that uh, that report uh, years later uh, when uh, covering a game that the uh, the Wings were playing years later. And it is a memory, uh, not just that game, but uh, the team, the Wichita Wings, that is indelible. It continues to uh, resonate uh, in the Wichita, Kansas area and frankly, among fans of 
the MISL and and uh, and beyond because the team was something else. It was a team that was an underdog uh, in an underdog city, in an underdog league, and arguably in an underdog sport. And uh, all of it is reminisced and in high quality form in this movie. Uh, and we're going to talk about it again with Adam Knapp and Mike Romalis in just a few moments. It is a fun conversation and it's a fun movie. And uh, stay tuned. You will enjoy all of it uh, for sure. Before you do that, though, uh, why don't you hop on over on your web browser to OldSchoolShirts.com, one of our great sponsors, a longtime one at that. And uh, and celebrate this episode by finding one of two tremendous, great uh, and awesome looking and comfortable at that Wichita Wings shirt. Yeah, there's a classic Wichita Wings logo uh, on a nice sort of blue gray background, uh, but in all of its orange and yellow goodness. Uh, and yeah, that logo, if you uh, if you remember it correctly, uh, a little bit of the Wonder Woman logo ish kind of look. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, if you're a fan of uh, the great hamburger chain called Whataburger, you know, there's a little familiarity there, too. You will do no uh, worse than to uh, get a uh, your very own Wichita Wings uh, commemorative T-shirt there at OldSchoolShirts.com. And uh, also, too, you can find another shirt there if you were part of the Orange Army, which is the uh, name of the the fan club and uh, just the amazing uh, fan base that uh, that Wichita had for their team. Well, there's that smart looking orange shirt called the Orange Army. Uh, as well for you there at OldSchoolShirts.com. And uh, it is uh, which, whichever shirt you get. And by the way, it's not just Wichita Wings stuff. There's all kinds of great MISL memories there. You want a shirt from the Hartford Hellions or the Philadelphia Fever or perhaps even the uh, the New York Arrows or the Chicago Horizons. Remember them? Uh, they're all there for you and then some. And by the way, it's not just MISL and soccer. It's all kinds of great sports and, frankly, all kinds of great cultural remembrances, whether it be a bar or a restaurant or a movie chain or a theater, perhaps a, a radio station or a television station of your, all of those things and more. And they make more of them all the time at OldSchoolShirts.com. And there's just a treasure trove of great stuff. And of course, we've got a promo code for you there. Make sure you use the promo code GOODSEATS and enjoy 10% off each and every one of your purchases uh, when you go there and shop early and shop often, as they say, OldSchoolShirts.com. Again, promo code GOODSEATS uh, for 10% off all of your Wichita wing shirts or any other shirt for that matter that you get. And uh, we thank our pal P.F. Wilson in Cincinnati uh, for his continued support of our little show, Graham. And uh, well, let's uh, let's move right into it, shall we, for this week. Our conversation as we get into the MISL's Wichita Wings and the movie. Coming up, God Save the Wings. Here they are, two of the producers of said film, Adam Knapp and Mike Romalis. Here's our conversation we had just last week. Please, as always, enjoy. Let's get into a little bit of sort of the, the the backstory of this, right? So clearly the Wichita Wings were quite the phenomenon in the midst of another phenomenon, right? That being the major indoor soccer league and indoor soccer uh, in general. But maybe before we get into a bit of that, maybe you can kind of both remind our audience in the case of Mike uh, and uh, introduce uh, in the case of Adam, uh, how you two both individually kind of got wrapped up into this wing story. What's your personal connection that uh, got you guys interested to pursue the story in book and then now in, in documentary film form? Well, um, you know, I, uh, my first game was, I was six years old. This was in 1982 and my family had season tickets. It was a big thing. We decided to start going and over about the next 10 years, you know, missed nary a game. And, uh, you know, in the subsequent years, as the wings folded out of existence and kind of faded out of people's memories, it just dawned on me, dang, this was just one of the biggest things in Wichita you know, years prior, and nobody talks about it anymore. And so fast forward, um, about four years ago, Tim O'Brien, one of our producers, he and I put together the book, Make This Town Big, the story of Roy Turner and the Wichita wings to really revisit that golden period of the 1980s uh, with the wings. And uh, as you said, Tim, during our interview at that time, you know, we had mentioned it was kind of a pipe dream at that time to turn this into a film. And uh, through just one of those things, you know, you meet people, you know, people through people, uh, Tim became acquainted with Adam. And Adam had just completed a film with our co-director, Kenny Lynn, 
called Out Here in Kansas, and Tim O'Brien uh, suggested to them we should do a film about the wings. And that was, well, getting on over three years ago. And so here we are with God Save the Wings. And Adam, I'm sure the uh, the allure of uh, millions of dollars of riches was uh, also part of the mix. No. <laughs> Oh, of course. Yeah, it's written in our contract, I think. It, yes. Um, no, I, um, you know, independent filmmaker, we we um, had just started our, our circuit with out here in Kansas, and um, Tim approached me, and T- Tim did not know this at the time, but I was a, a, a child of the 80s as well, and um, lived, I was a country kid. But uh, we went to our share of Wings games, and... Um, you know, it's such a, just such a unique slice of, you know, not only history in Wichita, but across the country of, um, of soccer. And, um, I just thought it would be really cool to, you know, bring this book to, uh, a, a venue that, or a medium that, you know, emphasize the images, emphasize the colors, because um, it was a very colorful league, you know, literally and figuratively. And it was just a natural uh, progression, I thought, to to document this because, you know, it it was very real. It was very big. And I didn't want history to forget it. You know, I, it, we, we've done a ton of different topics around teams and leagues no longer around. And, and a lot of it, not all, not all of it, but uh, there certainly is that, that overlap many in many instances around, especially boys of a certain age uh, who are now are older men, right, who have sort of uh, crystal clear memories in their, you know, formative years when they're sort of much more alert to sort of the things that are going on around them, uh, the things that they're first introduced to at the time, such as pro sports, but I think there's a little bit of that maybe uh, in your respective stories here. But maybe you can kind of sort of frame for our audience those outside of, of Wichita or even of the old major indoor soccer league. Probably not. It didn't dawn on you until years later just how unique a window uh, this was. But maybe the story of, of why it was so important for a city like Wichita, which really hadn't had a pro franchise of any sort ever, right, or the state at that time. Yeah, I mean, we are we are kind of in a college basketball part of the country, um, college football. Uh, Wichita has always had minor league baseball, so it's not that we were um, unfamiliar, you know, to going to sporting events. But when the Wings came around in 1979, um, soccer was, I mean, it was relatively visible. You know, Pele was was still playing or getting forced toward the end of his career. But then this new form of soccer was invented and came to Wichita. And it took, I guess, a couple of years uh, to get that real following. But, you know, I, I, to this day, I tell people it, it just, it really just took one game to make a new wings fan. And so between the action on the field, the personalities, you'd see them on TV, you'd see them everywhere. This thing just kind of kept growing. And these guys just kind of became our, our new citizens, our naturalized citizens, if you will. And, uh, yeah, like you say, this was, you know, we didn't have major league baseball. We were never going to be that kind of a city, but, uh, this window of indoor soccer being what it was in the early 80s, uh, we definitely, uh, the timing was in our favor. And I really took it for granted at the time that, you know, this league and this team was going to be around forever. You know, I had a favorite NFL team, baseball, basketball, and the Wings were my soccer team. And Mike Dollar was my favorite soccer player and still is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, you know, it's just one of those things that you, you think is going to be there when you're 50 years old. And um, of course the very nature of this podcast, I suppose is, um, you know, things, things don't always last. Well, in addition to that though, too, right. This isn't this just getting a, a pro sports team, right. This is getting a, a pro sports team in a, in a professional sport that is 
soccer and, and, a, and a particular brand new flavor of it called indoor soccer. To, to the extent that you can recollect, how, how do you get, you know, hooked and or interested in this in the first place? Was it the, hey, this is a top tier pro league or so we're told? Or was it sort of the excitement or the newness of, of a sport that was, you know, frankly new to many people, even big cities? You know, what, what were some of the essences, if you will, of of why you found yourselves going to these games? I, I well, think for me, it was just the name recognition um, you know, these guys were household names in Wichita. They were here year after year. Many of them made their home in Wichita. And in addition to that, the, you know, just the fanfare before the games, the, the, the lights and the, and the, you know, the fireworks and, and all that stuff. I'd never seen anything like that before. The NBA wasn't, wasn't doing that at the time and neither was anyone else. Um, I think the MISO is largely responsible for, you know, a lot of that pregame um, fanfare that we still see today. And one of the other things, and we do make this point in the movie, is that this was really one of the first times that a vast majority of the crowd was made up of, of women. And so I think it was Doug Verb who said, you know, to quote him in the book, you had a bunch of these, uh, you know, suave European guys running around in their underwear. Well, that was part of the league's marketing was sex sells. And so that got a lot of people, a lot of women out there. And so that, you know, it was one, really one of the first sports leagues that um, sort of exploited, you know, the good looks of its of its uh, players in that sense. <laughs> well, it's interesting because uh, not only we've had uh, Doug Verb uh, on this episode, I, I encourage our listeners to to you know, sit back and relax for the almost three hour interview we have with him because interesting guy he can talk. Eh? Oh my, yeah, but it's a it, but a fascinating, but it's a very fascinating sort of uh, uh, look into, and I think you're you're hitting the nail on the head, uh, Adam. The 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 promotional angle and the promotional you know pizzazz of this. I mean, I would argue that you know half of the MISL's appeal and allure was this excitement, this package, this sort of entertainment sort of phenomenon that occupied one's time for two, two and a half hours, either on television, where it just was magnetic and electric. But but clearly in the stands itself, it was it was it was not only a new sport, but it was just it was something completely different and and played at a, at a high level, which I think even made it even more interesting and intriguing. Uh, no question. Um, and, you know, the quality of the play was um, was just top notch. The things these guys were doing with the ball. Um, with their feet, uh, you know, we probably watched about a hundred wings games, uh, from the eighties and the skill levels just off the chart. Um, you can compare, compare them to just about anybody from today. Um, so yeah, the uniqueness of the era and, um, and the skill level of the players, I think, um, Wichita really grew to appreciate just how good these guys were. Well, let me, let me let's get into the process of it. Um, uh, as I, we'll get to some of the the names and the people and stuff. But you're mentioning watching over a hundred Wings games. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a cottage uh, sort of uh, nooks and crannies online, you know, about uh, sort of old uh, MISL and NASL games for that matter. Uh, and it's almost sort of a uh, a holy grail search for some of the the better and more remembered games. But g- give our audience a sense of how you go about to sort of. Uh, uh, Get a storyline together, and and the original materials uh, that you you sought for it, and then you know the folks that you wanted to interview. Get, give us a little bit of an insight into how you put together a story around the you know around this period of time and this team. I, I can't imagine it was sort of you know the easiest thing to find all the people involved and all the great archival material off the top of your head. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I had collected a lot of these games really just kind of for my own enjoyment over the years and just as to preserve them. But also in the back of my head that just in case a project like this would ever come about, we would, you know, I would have that available. And I still had, you know, a lot of my old game programs and a photo archive and goes on and on and on. And so this allowed us uh, to visually tell the story using a lot of things, you know, footage and photos that just haven't been seen in decades. And uh, this is just a, a great way to finally um, 
you know, display some of this stuff that still exists. And my co-director, Kenneth Lynn, who Michael uh, has already mentioned, um, he, he helped me make out here in Kansas, uh, the best editor I know. Um, he became highly interested in the project when he discovered that, hey, this, this guy, Mike Romalis, actually has all these DVDs of the games, and we're going to be able to get some fantastic B-roll, um, but it's going to take a lot of watching uh, 30-year-old games, <laughs> uh, you know, spending our Saturday nights and our Sunday mornings, um, you know, watching watching everything and we 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 sat through some some games that were uh not considered classics put it that way but just that just that one little moment that can be used in the film um it made it worth it so um you know putting together a narrative for this we we start to go chronological a little bit um you know as far as the the birth of the league and how little Wichita managed to get itself into this uh, major market uh, conference. And, uh, you know, we introduced the players, um, some of whom were real, were real characters, um, kind of give them a background and, and uh, it's just, you no, know, no question. Uh, and it's just kind of a ride from that. We, we, we edited the whole thing down to an hour, 40 minutes. And, um, it's, I think it's a, a really, really solid 100 minutes. Uh, it moves along and, um, I, I just, the entertainment value, we, we were trying to match what the wings brought us back in the day. I will tell you, having seen it, I, I th- it's 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 tremendous, and and I'm you know I, I I'm giddy because you know folks who haven't seen it yet, there there are I mean, and I consider myself somewhat of a an obsessionist, I guess, when it comes to old clips and the YouTube stuff, and you know, discovering of of new games and and clips and whatnot that have uh, you know not been surfaced previously, and I I, I was floored by frankly uh, how much I had never seen before, in particular, including sort of at the outset as you sort of. Uh, to the uh, uninitiated, sort of introduce a little bit of what this uh, uh, somewhat uh, eccentric sport of indoor soccer is. Uh, there's, there's a clip, and I don't want to give away some of the stuff here, but uh, there's a clip that I've never seen, and I wonder if uh, where you got it and or if it's the first ever. Uh, is this uh, little uh, intro with Jim Carvelis and Terry Lewicki, uh introducing sort of this sport? I, I wonder, was that the first ever ML- MISL game? I have to think now, I, I can't remember if that was from, I think it was a league promo. And um, and I, I'm trying to remember where that one surfaced. But but yes, it, it, once, it was just, you know, it was perfect because it was kind of scratchy and vintage-y looking. And it was a great way to initially kind of bring the viewer into, you know, the relatively simple idea of, of, indoor soccer and how it's played and right down to how the, the field is set up. But yes, to your point, it, it was, yeah, I, it's, it's amazing footage. And I have to say, we've watched a lot of footage, but as a long time, you know, wings fan historian or whatever, I, I, I too get giddy anytime I see something that I have not seen related to the old MISL. One of our initial ideas was to, um, make this film kind of uh, kind of incorporate some scratchy, grainy VHS light effects, as if you were watching a VHS tape. But uh, as it turns out, that was completely unnecessary. Yeah, we didn't need any special there. effects. <laughs> well, so how do you? I, I guess from a process perspective, how do you? How do you, if you will, upgrade or uh, upconvert uh, those things to make them at least you know more consumable and watchable, sort of in a modern digital sense is it was that a challenge or did you have a process that you perfected i mean don't well, give me any secrets yeah i mean a lot of it was um if you have a vhs tape it's you know you can usually it's not that hard to convert it digitally you know we, there's a place here in town i just take them to they do good work and uh, so once you have it on a dvd then you can upload it to your computer and then you can just do whatever you want with it you know take whatever clips and you know, just put it anywhere that you want. It's, I, I, it's, we're taking 20th, 20th century technology into the 21st century and manipulating it. But it's, uh, but it's, it's amazing what you can do with it. And having said that, there's only so much you can do with it. I mean, you can, 
you can try to sweeten the sound and, and correct the color. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if, um, you know, some, some of these clips we use were really rough and, um, you know, if you just, I guess, uh, tell people it, it adds to the charm. Well, speaking of charm, uh, maybe let's get into some of the personalities and, and, and let's start with, uh, uh, the master of ceremony, so to speak. Tell me, tell me how you guys came to, uh, center around Andy Chapman as the narrator uh, for this entire story? Well, um, I initially didn't want a narrator. Um, I thought we would be able to piece together the clips, um, just our, the sound bites. I thought we'd be able to make it flow without it. But as we got further and further along, it was gonna, it was clear to us that we needed something or someone to glue, glue the whole thing together. So um, we considered... Um, we considered a few people, but Andy, Andy Chapman just seemed to be the guy. He, um, was, you know, one of their most popular players, maybe the most popular. He kind of has this, uh, lovable rogue vibe about him that we loved. Um, and we did a, um, a, um, oh, I guess you'd call it a, a narrative piece. Or uh, we did a we we shot a scene with him that was not uh, necessarily, you know, 100% document documentary style. Um, and you know, we looked that over for a few months, and just ultimately came to the agreement that we should fly him back in and just have him um, kind of take us through the journey and. Uh, you know, was fantastic. Uh, we're, we're really happy with the final product. Um, you know, Andy's not an actor. He's a, he's a professional athlete and, um, you know, sometimes he had to be patient and we had to be patient. Um, but, but I, I'll say he this, was, he, he, he wanted to get it right though. You know, he really did. Oh he, yeah. You know, if, if there were multiple takes, he, you know, like, you know, he, he wanted to do it until it was right. And so, and before we started, he, he told us he, you know, back when he did commercials and everything, he was known as one take Andy, um, one take Andy, as it turns our theory is he only wanted to do one take <laughs> and then he was going to declare it good. Um, so that's where the patience came in. Right. No, but he, he was fantastic. And, you know, I mean, these guys, they, they haven't really changed much in all these years. Their personalities, you know, they they were what they were. They still are what they are. So he he, he was really great, though. And he was willing to do some, some goofy stuff that uh, I, I think a lot of people would have said no to. But Andy was always game. Well, no, and I, I think he does hold it, uh, hold that uh, the theme uh, together, including, uh, I guess, as as sort of uh, found out a little later in the film, you know, he was quite the, um, shall we say, uh, not only the on-field personality, but also a personality, shall we say, off the field, too. At least the rumor had it. Yes, yes, yes. I, I expect that there will be a few uh, ladies in the audience who uh, might have some fond memories of uh, of Andy Chapman, to be sure. Well, I also think it's uh, it's it's nice too that you've got a, a whole. I mean, you you not only get into some of the uh, the uh, the players and and the the unique memories and and situations that sort of popped out from the uh, from the d- during the course of the team's uh, existence there, but also you know things that are are you know integral to the the broader story, like the angels that you're sort of maybe p- potentially hinting at the angels being the dance team that was uh, quite supportive. It I, I thought it was pretty interesting too where. You know, you talk about sort of how there are rules and, and expectations and, and regulations, I guess, of how the the ladies' uh, uh, team are to perform and and uh, and how their their decorum and 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 how they're supposed to sort of position themselves in the in the community and stuff. And one of those things, right, was the, I guess, the prohibition or at least the uh, assumption that there would be no fraternizing, shall we say, with with team members. And it seems like I don't know that that rule. They say rules were meant to be broken, but. Um, I don't know. Some some intimations there, uh, for sure. Well, you know, again, not to give too much away, but to quote one person in the film, healthy boys are going to find healthy girls. And so, yeah, I I mean, I don't know how much it went on, but I mean, we've got some documented proof that it did. It did. 
What's this? The Arizona Office of Tourism Spring Training. Oh, my God. Hey, this spring, follow your favorite baseball teams to Arizona for Cactus League Spring Training. Amazing weather and landscapes, exciting outdoor adventure, incredible food, Arizona. It's the perfect home base for baseball fans. Follow your favorite baseball teams to Arizona for Cactus League Spring Training. 10 stadiums, 15 Major League Baseball teams, and 75 degree temperatures. Ah, awesome. And all 10 stadiums are in the greater Phoenix area, all within 50 miles of the city. Meet players, get autographs before the games, and just enjoy an old-fashioned ballpark experience in beautiful preseason weather down in Arizona. Check out amazing restaurants and bars nearby, including tons of craft breweries like Four Peaks, Angel's Trumpet Ale House, and Goldwater Brewing Company. Enjoy live music from local and national artists and explore museums featuring everything from native heritage to modern art to musical instruments from around the world and more. Arizona is known for its incredible landscapes, too, as well as thrilling outdoor adventures. So hit the road and explore Arizona's urban centers or ghost towns or artsy communities or quirky outposts. You can hike, you can bike, you can take Jeep tours, hot air balloon rides, skydiving, jet skiing, or just taking in a good old-fashioned sunset. No matter what you love to do, Arizona has you covered. Check out must-see destinations from your bucket list, like the Grand Canyon, Monument Valley, Horseshoe Bend, and even the great Old West City of Tucson. Bringing the kids along for spring training? Hey, Arizona's a fantastic destination for families, too. Family-friendly resorts and hotels offer plenty of fun for kids of all ages, from water parks to horseback rides to games and activities. Arizona also has tons of stuff for kids to do and see like wildlife parks and science museums, aquariums, and even dude ranches. So what are you waiting for? Plan now for your spring training getaway at visitarizona.com slash spring training. That's visitarizona.com slash spring training. Hey, and don't forget, send us a postcard. Some names of uh, of some of the players that uh, especially stood out. I mean, I've got my favorites uh, from ones that I remember, but I, I maybe we could I could give you a kick off a hint. The this Danish mafia, uh, you know, was certainly a core. Uh, maybe uh, some names and some uh, particular folks that that stood out. Maybe as you thought going into the process of interviewing them, and maybe some differences about or changes of, of thought as you sort of put all the pieces together after the interviews. Well, I, I think having having done the book um you know we we found a lot of these players to be very open we found that their memories were still pretty good and so you know to be sure we we got a lot of the players and personalities from the book but we also were able to uh obtain some interviews from people that did make the book some of the danes in our trip to uh denmark uh, so guys like Per Runfed and Jurgen Christensen, uh, we were able to finally get Eric Rasmussen here to Wichita. We had a great interview with him. And so, you know, we, we were able, you know, finding these personalities, it's, 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 uh, finding these, these guys to interview and, and bring them back on to film, so to speak. This, that was a great, um, a coup for us, I guess you could say. Yeah, two two of the guys that really surprised me. One was um, Kim Runfed, uh, who we interviewed actually in the very building that Mike and I are in right now. Um, you know, my memory of him as a child was that he was a um, he was just a, a, a blue eyed, silent, ice cold badass. Um, you know, he he he. If you were to look up you know, Dane in the dictionary, there would be a, a picture of Kim with his icy cold blue eyes. And, um, you know, this guy's probably on the Mount Rushmore of indoor soccer. Um, you know, but when we interviewed him, a uh, very down to earth guy, uh, extremely laid back. And, um, you know, he, he, Kind of, kind of told me that I, I was mistaken about him. He, you know, he, he played hard and he was, he was always up for a good battle. But, um, 
you know, he had just as much fun as, as anyone to be sure. The other guy was, uh, Jurgen Christensen, who, um, you know, when I was a, a fan back in the day, I, I didn't pay much attention to Jurgen because I thought he was a, a cranky old man. Um, and now I'm kind of fascinated with Jurgen because he was a cranky old man. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just, he cracks us up and, uh, watching these clips, you know, you cannot take your eyes off Jurgen because, you know, one, because he was so animated and we've got, um, we've got their old beat writer, Tom Stein quoted in the book as saying Jurgen had a little Hamlet in him, which is a hundred percent true. Uh, but secondly, uh, and I did not realize this, you know, back then, but he was kind of what made their offense go just because he was so skilled he was such a good passer and he was so precise and, you know, very demanding of his teammates, uh, very demanding on his coach. Um, but you know, for sure, he's, he's one of the best characters in the movie. And, um, I was, I, I, our, our, maybe, maybe, you know, one of the, probably the best interview we did in Denmark was when we went to his home and, um, and he's still a cranky old man. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have very good candy though. That's a whole nother story though, Adam, right? Oh yes. Yeah. So I, I made the mistake of, uh, <laughs> taking something from a licorice dish and I'm still trying to get the taste out of my mouth. <laughs> Uh, well, it's interesting because every, to a player, and frankly, and others too, uh, there, you've got a, a whole smattering of people. Everybody from, you know, Bill Kentling, who's obviously very integral to the story, to uh, you know, people who are part of the promotion and/or the broadcasting uh, uh, side of things. And every, but but to a player though, it seems that uh, either through well a great selection of your of your interviewees or. Uh, or maybe you truly are onto something. I mean, it, it feels like there was uh, you can you can hear it and see it in the in the dialogue, uh, and even in their facial expressions. A uh, I don't know. Affection is is maybe almost too too weak a word. It almost feels like it was a, a, a nothing but but fondness and of memory. Uh, it seems, and it comes out. I think not only in the film but in the conversations that you have with these folks. You know, I, I'm of the opinion that you know when a lot of these guys started playing. You know, and that would, in a lot of cases, it could have been, you know, in the early '70s. I I can't imagine any of them would have imagined having ever played a type of soccer in front of the types of crowds in the middle of North America. You know, when when they began playing, and so you know, I, I think that these years it made such an impression on them. And uh, to you know, to your point, you know it their memories and their expressions their their it it really does in a lot of cases uh come out in the interview and um you know in a lot of you know it, it just so happens in a lot of cases we had great footage to follow up some of their quotes in fact sometimes you'd almost think that we were feeding them lines because you know the the footage or the image that we would have was just so perfect uh to you know to the quote Absolutely. And Mike was uh, very involved in the editing process with uh, with Kenny and myself. Um, and I think he really knows what he's talking about. And, and Tim, I appreciate your uh, I appreciate your opinion about that, because um, I'd never really I'd never really thought about that after after all this time. Um, just, I guess, because, you know, we're first too close to the trees to see the forest. So, um so thank you for that. You're one of the you're one of the handful of people who has actually seen this thing. Well, I, I, what I, I'm also amazed too is is the um, uh, how the the, the fan uh, interaction uh, with the with the players uh, you know uh, played out over the years, and I think you captured that pretty well too uh, in this film. The idea of, I mean, you kind of alluded to it, but uh, there's an adjustment, right? I mean, you've got a lot of these players who are. I think you referenced them as party boys from Europe, but I, you know, these obviously were some of the star players, especially in Denmark. Uh, you know, coming over to literally the middle of this country, in the middle of a state in the middle of this country, a city, you know, that you have to squint to get to half a million people to maybe qualify, if you will, for consideration in the MISL at the time. 
but the marriage, you know, which seems on paper to be like, ugh, don't know how this is going to go. It truly became quite something, this relationship between the fans and these players who were playing a foreign version of the sport in a foreign land, literally and figuratively in their minds. Yeah, I mean, I think that was part of the team. I mean, they wanted to get them out to the community. So you'd see, you know, I I remember they used to come to my school and put on assemblies. You'd see them at soccer clinics. You'd see them just out and about. And um, I don't think after a while the players needed much nudging, you know, to get out and and enjoy life a little bit. I mean, you know, these these guys, you know, they they were used to that kind of lifestyle anyway, I think, and coming to a town where they were you know, really the the center attraction. They really didn't have much competition in the way of sports in the winter here. So, um they were so well known and you know, some of them married local girls and some of them of course are still uh, living here. So, um, the wings touched a lot of people, you know, a lot of lives were affected because of the wings all these years later. I'm told Wichita did not have high school soccer before the wings came along. No, not until about the second year of the wings. Yeah. About 1980 did the high school soccer become an official uh, sport. Well, you know, not having grown up there, but having seen obviously many MISL games on, on television and going to games, you know, locally in the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area, you know, Wichita certainly stuck out because it wasn't a common, you know, city that people sort of would regale or regard as uh, quote unquote major league. So I, I get the sense that, you know, the fan uh, uh, enthusiasm too was also sort of rooted in this, uh, not unlike the book's title, right? Uh, truly trying to make this town big. In many respects, and, and we've seen this theme on, on many different occasions, many different sports, where communities feel that having a pro team of some sort uh, can really go a long way in uh, raising its profile and its uh, civic pride and, and arguably uh, financial uh, benefits and, and other things that come along with it. I got to think the community spirit and the, uh, the boosterism of, of the city uh, was certainly uh, shot nicely in the arm by the arrival of this team and, and then some. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, like I said earlier, Wichita has typically been sort of in that, you know, minor league size city. So uh, the fact that we were playing these city, you know, these cities, New York and Los Angeles and Chicago, and we, you know, we were always the smallest market team with the smallest arena, but we wanted to make a good showing. And even though Wichita never won the league championship, a lot of teams never won the league championship. I think that, you know, we, we had a lot of pride in showing that we could compete with the big boys and we did it on the smallest budget. But um, I think a lot of players took a lot of sort of that, what do we call it? A, a hometown discount because they knew that they had a really good thing going here in Wichita uh, they knew that they were going to be playing in front of big crowds and people would appreciate their skills. You know, they made lots of friends here and enjoyed the life. And so, you know, living in Wichita, as it turns out, I mean, uh, going back to the book, I think Chico Borja's first memory was seeing cows outside of his, uh, his hotel window. But as time went on, you know, I, I think that uh, playing in Wichita was probably one of the best career decisions they ever made from a personal and professional standpoint. You know, right after uh, right after we're done with this podcast, Michael and I are uh, are going to be on our way to a Wichita Wings game. We, we still have indoor soccer in Wichita. Um, you know, it, it's more of a developmental team, um, a smaller arena. Um but it's 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 <laughs> it's it, it came back this year, and that I, I, was, I was at their season opener, and the fans were screaming their head off, and um, I learned a I learned a very important lesson, which was never underestimate brand recognition. And yeah. Wings certainly had that. Yeah, yeah, they're they're playing in the uh, MASL two league this year. And uh, in fact, but they're playing a friendly today against the Kansas City Comets. So there you go. Well, there's another name from the MISL. So before you run to that game, let me uh, let's uh, circle a couple of, of last sort of things here to get uh, more appetites whetted for for this film. 
So you're mentioning the Kansas City Comets, which obviously were quite a successful franchise, relatively speaking, in the old original MISL as well. And, you know, I think from an outsider's perspective, you would think that, uh, ge- at least geographically, right, the Comets uh, would have been the most naturally assumed rival uh, for the Wings. And, and it took me a while to sort of come to this conclusion, but I'm, I'm glad you got there, right, which is this team called the St. Louis Steamers, which wound up becoming truly the nemesis of this Wichita Wings original franchise. What do you think it was about the Steamers in particular? Uh, and maybe you can kind of sort of dance around without maybe giving away too much about how how central, I guess, that rivalry with the St. Louis Steamers was in the Wings' history. Well, uh, I think it all starts with uh, two personalities, one named Don Ebert and the other Steve Petcher. And <laughs> St. Louis, you know, they were... They were gen- they were really the the one team in the league that was primarily made up of um, Americans, and uh, in fact, most of them were from the St. Louis area. I mean, St. Louis had you know really one of the biggest soccer histories you know in the country. So it wasn't really that hard to find local talent there. But you know, from the initial, um, really kind of started with that infamous playoff game in March 1981. And then, um, you know, St. Louis just played a very different style, more of a, you would almost, if you equate it sort of like to North American hockey versus uh, European hockey, they played very rough. They very they played the body um, and um, versus our, you know, kind of more of a finesse style. And so this rivalry just kind of grew and grew. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that it was, it truly was, I think, the best rivalry in the league uh, for for a period of time. Um, you, you just, you, even as a kid, I, I I could feel the tension. I could feel, you know, on game day when the steamers were coming to town, and then you would get to the game, and oh, you could just, you knew something was going to happen. And sometimes there would be a fight, or sometimes it would be a, a hard fought overtime win. But man, it was such such an event whenever the steamers came to town and uh, oh I, I have to say this you also in one of your other podcasts tim you uh, you interviewed bob carpenter and bob kind of has uh, almost a cameo in the film because at the time in the 80s he was one of the announcers for the st louis steamers so you you'll probably hear his voice in there at times absolutely and and he had some very vivid memories of, of the steamers and and uh yes and a highly recommended uh, uh, uh other interview to listen to so if you want to pause this one listeners and and check out our episode with bob carpenter it's uh he's got fascinating stories and tales about the steamers time uh, back in the old uh, igloo it's interesting though that you mentioned um and i remember vividly too watching that uh that uh major indoor soccer league semifinal, which at the time, this was the third year of its uh, of the league's existence. You mentioned it was March twenty seventh, nineteen eighty one, and uh, if you're not familiar with that game, I I, I urge you to uh, either before or after watching uh, God Save the Wings. Uh, it, it is probably one of the I don't know. It, there are certainly many exciting games in in the old major indoor soccer league's history, but but if you're talking about tension and drama and uh, fits and turns and 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 by the way that entire weekend that entire semifinal weekend because it was a double header we got the other game was uh, uh, the arrows uh, inching their way to uh, ultimately another final against the uh, St. Louis Steamers I think it was the game afterwards but my God watching that game on the USA Network it was draining because it it was one of the only shootouts it was only a handful of shootouts uh, in league history but but if you're looking for a a quintessential example or exemplar of what that rivalry was between the Wings and the Steamers. You you owe it to yourself to get and watch that entire game uh, because uh, I, I would argue even even the film doesn't do it justice because it was such uh, it it was such a uh, an example of of uh, just the rivalry that was uh, just so amazing uh, to watch uh, on on the field. Yeah, and through all this through all this game footage we've watched uh, time and time again, uh, the Wings. Uh, highest highs and lowest lows. They most of them seem to be against St. Louis. Whether it was, um, you know, not beating in the in the playoffs for the first time, or uh, you know, Jan Olsen, the, the Wichita goalkeeper, coming out and, and actually scoring a goal that was against St. Louis. Um, it just 
it just uh, this word's a little overused, but it, it truly was an organic um, type of rivalry that um, that never really uh, developed with Kansas City, although there were certainly some battles with them too. I, I think it was kind of funny. We uh, we've certainly invited Steve Petcher to come to our premiere, and I think Adam was he quoted as saying, "Is it safe for me to come here?" Is it safe? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Steve was a very willing villain for our documentary. Rick Davis is in uh, in Central K- uh, Kansas as well. We've had him on in a previous episode too. I hope he could make it too. I'm sure he's got a few couple of memories and I, there are a couple of incidences that that are uh, remembered in the movie too for with him yeah oh, uh, ricky a has a uh, with jürgen <laughs> yeah you know ricky has a steak yeah, restaurant the not far from here believe it or not yes he does a beautiful ellsworth uh kansas all right so one last thing i want to sort of throw out there because i think it's also very uh important to the story too uh, you mention it during the course of it, and it is probably the best metaphor for the uh, the love affair that was uh, between the team and its fans. Uh, but it was the the reality of of the team for for more than one occasion, and that was sort of the save the wings uh, campaigns, plural, right? Um, despite being sort of that underdog team in the underdog league, and I guess arguably the underdog sport, right? And and despite sort of that. Uh, that intense, uh, beautiful relationship between the fans and the uh, and the team. Uh, it wasn't always the most financially uh, uh, stable of situations for various reasons. Uh, maybe a little bit on 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 that. I mean, uh, clearly, you know, seeing this most professional team in Kansas uh, potentially going away, and 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 seeing uh, time and again fans coming to the rescue. Do you think that that was that maybe the team went to the well a little too much on, on that one, uh, or or maybe that was sort of an indication of the league's health I- itself? Or what? What do you? What What are sort of the the takeaways from sort of the the save the wings uh, uh, phenomenon that uh, kept the team going for as long as it did in the eighties? Well, I, I think to be sure, after a while, it it kind of became a running joke, and uh, you know. He, I think we even saw uh, even a YouTube comment, not a YouTube or a comment somewhere, maybe on Facebook alluding to that. But yeah, I, it was, it was, it was a, a tough financial proposition to have a team in this league, especially, as I said, you know, we were in the smallest market. Um, of course, this was before major TV money. So there wasn't, you, you didn't have that. A lot of it was just based on season ticket sales and advertising um, the orange army they were always very good at raising some money for the wings but it really you know for a while it it was kind of a year-to-year existence and, you know you look at the crowds and you know you'd think how could they be losing money but at the end of the year oh well, you know we've lost 600 and some thousand dollars so we need to have a ticket drive but people kept doing it people kept Buying tickets, I think in the end, uh, we decided that Wichita is better with than without the wings. And uh, so we kept the team here as long as uh, at least the MISL uh, was in in existence, which I think uh, was a real accomplishment. I don't think any other team could say at that time that uh, from start to finish, uh, the wings, uh, you know, that their team played the entire existence of the MISL. Well, no, and and the successor of the NPSL, and 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 now arguably uh, the Wings' uh, name coming back and whatnot. So I mean, it, it's it, it's to me that's that's part of the uh, sort of not only the history, but also sort of the um, you know sort of the 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 bigger story about all this, right? The, this is a, a team that is uh, still fondly remembered, and arguably is still very much part of the fabric uh, of the sports landscape in in the Midwest and in, in Wichita in particular. And uh, I think my guess is that's why. You're getting such a uh, a warm and probably uh, soon to be overwhelming response to this film when it debuts, because there is that not only memory but also, frankly, some legacies that have uh, come out of of this team that wasn't just a a come and go kind of situation. I think that um, the film is definitely going to um, you know leave its footprints. I think um, a lot of a lot of young people are going to watch this and um, you know kind of be blown away, I hope. Hey, while well, I had no idea that this was such a phenomenon in Wichita, not only with sports, but, you know, it crossed over into, 
you know, Wichita social pages. It was a, uh, you know, pop culture phenomenon in the eighties. Um, you know, it was a simpler time to be sure. Um, but, you know, I think people are going to be um, surprised by some of the chances we took with the film. You know, we've got some some Monty Python type um, animation. We we had the film scored by uh, kind of a fusion jazz trio. They play some funk. Um, we had a lot of fun with the music. Well, it's a hundred minutes of fun, is what it is, Tim. And um, I think I think that's that's going to um, you know, but for better or worse, that's, um, this is what we've got. And, um, I, but I suspect people are going to love it. Yeah. And I also, you know, I also want to say thank you to our, one of our other producers, Tori Deathridge. She came aboard. She's been very good at Absolutely. kind of the marketing, the marketing side and knowing people and, and knowing people who can get us money. And so absolutely. I want to uh, thank her and, uh, you know, we've, you know, I, I think this film, in a lot of ways, it's very representative of the original Wings franchise in that it it has taken a lot of people, a lot of very generous people, to to bring this uh, to, to film. You know, we had a lot of you know donations and people lending their time and expertise and materials and money and everything else. So we are a five person crew, but um, you know we we couldn't have done this without the generosity of so many people. We'll be dropping this episode uh, the uh, Monday uh, prior to the uh, the debut of the film on the twenty first of February, twenty twenty. And if you're in the Wichita area or Kansas City or can you know a day's drive and get there on Friday the twenty first, I would hope there would be at least a ticket or two available. I, I know the VIP party has been long sold out, but Saturday the twenty second. I'm sorry, my mistake. Saturday the twenty second. We'll edit that we'll out for sure. But if if you want to show up on the twenty first and then camp out, I perhaps. You know. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I don't know if you'll get any any benefit from such. But uh, how uh, though, uh, if for folks who cannot uh, get there for whatever reasons, what are the plans for getting this more, shall we say, widely distributed and or accessible? Well, we uh, we haven't really thought that far ahead yet. But if you are interested in seeing uh, God Save the Wings, which is pretty representative of the uh, of the entire MISL. Um, I would encourage you to go to jobsavethewings.com and, um, you know, dro- drop us a line. Say, hey, I, I, I live in Chicago or I live in uh, in San Francisco and, you know, I'd really like for this film to, you know, maybe maybe you um, would encourage them to be in, the, in a certain film festival um, if you've got connections there. Um, that would be the best way to, um, to express that. And, uh, we're hoping to show all over the country and all over the world. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I look, there are there are tons of uh, major indoor soccer league fans and indoor soccer fans generally and just fans of, of soccer from back when, you know, it was top tier professional uh, for the first real time here in this country. And uh, the MISL was a, a white hot comet for sure. And it was uh, clearly in places like Wichita, especially in places like Wichita, where uh, it was uh, electric, and it was uh, quite the phenomenon. And uh, you guys have done it uh, more than justice by uh, this tremendous film, which I encourage any fan of the MISL of indoor soccer to uh, figure out a way to get to and watch. So uh, we uh, we highly encourage uh, you folks to to reach out if you if you can't for whatever reasons uh, uh, get to Wichita. You want to send us a note or whatever, but uh, I you will be tickled by all of it. And and there are Easter eggs. A plenty. If you think you know everything about the MISL, uh, you will be surprised and 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 just overwhelmed by by the uh, meticulousness of it, uh, the uh, tale, uh, the great footage. Uh, even for the most uh, uh, persnickety of fans, you will probably find something uh, in there that you have never seen before. And uh, I I can't uh, wish you more luck than I uh, am doing right now for not only the debut on uh, Saturday the twenty second of February twenty twenty. Uh, but also, hopefully, it uh, permeates the uh, the sports fans' uh, world beyond that, and uh, we uh, uh, love look forward to hopefully uh, spreading the gospel, shall we say, that people can see this movie, God Save the Wings. And I appreciate both of you taking time to tell us more about it and uh, and keep the memory of the Wings and the MISL alive. It was a great time, you know. It was a great time, you know. It's a long time fan. I mean, I I I'm I never in my wildest dreams. I mean, I you know. 
the, the ideas that Adam and and Ken came up with, I you know I, I wouldn't uh, I, I couldn't have made a better film if I tried. All right, our thanks to Adam and Mike, and the movie again is called "God Save the Wings." Uh, it is making its world premiere debut on uh, this coming Saturday, February 22nd at the Orpheum Theater in Wichita, Kansas. If you are listening to this episode uh, the week we drop it uh, on the 17th of February and onward, uh, you still have a chance, hopefully, to get some tickets. Uh, find out more about that and such at GodSaveTheWings.com. And of course, if you're listening to this episode after the 22nd of February, uh, make sure you uh, head over to that website to find out when and where and how, frankly, the uh, movie will be more widely available and distributed. Uh, As you heard the the guys say that the intention is to have it much more uh, widely uh, dispersed. And uh, there are plenty of MISL and indoor soccer fans out there that would love uh, to see that movie if they even if they weren't uh, fans directly or residents of Wichita. And uh, we will, of course, try to keep you abreast uh, uh, through our channels as well, not only on our our little show here verbally and orally, but also uh, on the website, too, that uh, is devoted to our little show. That's GoodSeatsStillAvailable.com. Of course, that's the place where you can uh, enjoy all of our previous episodes, 150 some odd at this, this point and more to come. And uh, it's a good place to also orient your friends who have uh, no idea about the show, but you're, you're telling them about them. We appreciate that to check us out and, uh, you know, pick an episode or two that they might enjoy and then maybe add us uh, or add uh, the show to uh, their feeds as they uh, go through podcast lane. We appreciate that. Uh, We appreciate you following us on social media. You'll find us on uh, Twitter at Good Seats Still Available. No, excuse me. That's our that's our uh, Instagram. That's Good Seats Still Available at Good Seats Still Available. That's us on Instagram. There, got that straight. On Twitter, we're just at Good Seats Still. Yeah, at Good Seats Still. That's that's us on Twitter. Uh, on Facebook, you'll find a page devoted to us as well. Uh, what else? Let's see. You can on our website, uh, you can find our little link to our email newsletter. You can sign up for that. Why don't you? And if you want to just send us some good old fashioned email, hey, you can do that, too. Our address is hello at good seats still available dot com. Uh, what else? Yes. Jerry Payne, Jerry Payne, the good doctor. We can't do our show without him. Uh, he puts all of our uh, collective pieces together and does a fine job and then some. And we appreciate his services as well, as always. And uh, we appreciate you, of course, for listening, Uh, not only this far, but just generally. I'm I'm just uh, I'm humbled, frankly, at just the uh, thousands now of listeners, many thousands of listeners that are uh, dialed into this show, have added it to their feeds. uh, And frankly, not just in the United States and Canada, but all over the world. And I every I'm talking every nook and cranny, uh, every corner of the globe. It's just it's unbelievable who listens to this show. And uh, I can't thank you enough uh, for doing so, for recommending it to your friends, adding us to your feeds and, uh, and, you know, leaving us a rating and review once in a while where you can too. Uh, All of it uh, just really helps. And uh, we are heartened by, uh, by your listenership and your fandom. And uh, we appreciate it to no end. Uh, And uh, to no end, of course, is this episode. We are going to now leave you. Of course, we can't leave you hanging. We got to leave you with a theme song. And of course the wings have not disappointed. Uh, And we leave you now with Go For It. Yes, the official theme song of the Wichita Wings as we take you out. Enjoy the movie, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.